Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. I've been thinking about changing the opening a little bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah. To what? I don't know exactly. Yeah? Uh, I think I was going to change to, like, broadcasting nearly live. <laughs> nearly live? <laughs> or, or live to tape, or, or something yeah. like that. Because, you know, we don't actually put it out as we're recording. Yeah, yeah. So it's not really live. Yeah. I mean, but it's live. Like, we're recording it live. We don't really do anything to... I was going to say, I mean, we're not, like, editing it or anything. Yeah. Really. I mean, we, yeah. we make some... Do some edits just to improve the sound quality yeah. um, and clip insertions. Yeah. And that's that's it. So when, if one of us says relevant. something dumb, like, <laughs> it just stays in. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, you cursing at the end of the last one, I didn't even bother. <laughs> yeah. Right. I didn't even I didn't even put, a, like, a oops yeah. it over it or something like that. Yeah. Um, which I considered, and then I was like, "Yeah, I don't." That's nah, just one. It'll yeah, be fine. Not, too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, too much trouble. I thought I had a recording of something to go over accidental curse words. You did. I want to say it was like a golf swing or something. No, that wasn't me. That was that was uh, Jen Briney had a golf swing. Oh, she okay. used to Throw over her stuff on Congressional yeah. Dish. Okay. Now I never had. I, it was something that I had. I thought that, that you had, I had, had recorded. sourced it. Yeah. No, I had recorded myself. Yeah. It was just like me saying like "oops" or something like that. Yeah. Um, Can't I find it. I, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea where it is. And yeah. that's something that I don't think I would have dropped into the clips folder. I would have left it in the main folder so that it was Accessible. easy to find. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. So either I didn't do it, or I deleted it, or I moved it somewhere where I shouldn't have. Yeah. And I'm I'm actually thinking that I I just think that I did that. And you didn't did. you didn't actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds more accurate. Yeah. Just like me. That sounds like you. <laughs> yeah. Like I thought about it enough that I've convinced myself that it happened. That you but did it, it never, yeah. It never actually happened. Oh man. Um so I don't know where to start exactly. Actually, you know where where to start? So I listened to um, Dave Smith's uh, Part of the Problem episode about the Libertarian Convention. Oh, yeah. And I was so disappointed. In what? In, in the Dave, episode? mostly. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, well, I think he's pretty disappointed in, in himself, if that makes you feel any better. No, I, well, that's part of what disappoints me. That's ridiculous. He has no reason to take all that on. I completely um, agree. He, like, you know, it's not his this, fault. This is a, this is a the choice. the truth is that this hasn't been a failure. Yeah. Uh, it was just like this very black-pilled episode about the Libertarian Party, and I think that that's ridiculous. No. There's been a lot, a, a lot accomplished. And he's not responsible. I mean, I, I sure as hell wish that he'd stayed in the running for president. But Well, I wish that he had been able to. Like, And yeah. I'm sure, I mean, life's full of choices. You always choose your family first, mm -hmm. which is what he did. And, oh, yeah. and I 100% support him in that. Absolutely. Like, I wish circumstances had played out in a way where he had felt comfortable enough to make that run. Yeah. Um, but I was disappointed that there was no... I mean, there was like a little bit of a nod to, well, maybe Rechtenwald made a mistake this one time. Yeah, he didn't really like... Um, but yeah. to me, it just represented a fundamental misunderstanding of what his job would be as a presidential candidate. Yeah. And that completely turned me off of him. Yeah. And maybe I'm being too judgmental, but... Well, we I think all of the Mises Caucus, from what I understand, not all, a vast majority of the Mises Caucus had their reservations about Rectum Walt from the word go. Yeah. Um, and really, if Dave is to take any blame, I think that's where the blame lays, is that that Dave would not back down from Rectum Wall is the guy. This is who I'm endorsing. This is our candidate. And that when the pushback was as heavy as it was initially when he did that first podcast with Dave, mm -hmm. there should have been some consideration that, hey, maybe, maybe we need to guy. maybe we need to look elsewhere. Yeah. Um and uh, like I will put that on Dave because I feel like at least he was the face of that. Well, he was the face of it, but who was making the decisions? I mean, it, it, probably, it sounds like Michael Heiss is the Heiss one that's like be. pushing all of these kind of yeah. where the Mises caucus is going to go. Yeah. And I, I certainly hold him responsible for, uh, I, I hold Michael Heiss responsible for um, Chase Oliver being our 
yeah. presidential candidate. I agree with that. Being unwilling to compromise in any way off of Rechtenwald. Yeah. Being so certain that his calculations were correct or whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. That, like, no, maybe you should have... Maybe you should have listened to people who aren't just, like, blind followers of whatever... Yeah. Well, those yeah. voices were out there heavy because, um, like I say, from that first podcast that Rectum Wall did, the voices were pretty heavy from our people. Mm-hmm. Just like, look, like, like, sure, he's a great guy, but he's not what we're looking for. Yeah. I so, mean, I don't know. Like, I know that we have some Mises Caucus people and some Mises Caucus people that are influential that listen to the podcast. Um, and I'm all in for the Mises caucus. Like I, I like their plan for the party. I, yeah. I'm all in ideologically. Uh, I mean, I have some disagreements because I'm a libertarian, but, uh, <laughs> but, but my, there is ones. no hundred percent, you yeah. know, agreement on all, all yeah. things that should be or whatever. But, um, but I'm all in on the plan yeah. on how the party should move forward and their idea of how the party should move forward and so forth. Yeah. But I vote my conscience. Yeah. When I meant those things, I don't care what sign you're holding up. Vote <laughs> yes, vote no. I'm going to vote what I think is the right vote. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and if I don't understand what's going on, then I certainly ask somebody around me that understands the weirdness of, <laughs> of um, parliamentary mm. procedure better than me because it yeah. can be, it can get convoluted, definitely. Yeah. But I, I don't need somebody to tell me what to vote. Yeah. Um, I need to give me, I need somebody sometimes to give me information so that I can figure out how to vote. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I've always been turned off by, and not just the Mises caucus. There have been plenty of groups in the libertarian party since I've been a member, um, that have, uh, held signs or given some kind of signal to all the people that were, aligned with them or whatever this is how you should vote on this this is how you should vote on that as the votes are going on vote yeah. yes vote no whatever it happens to be yeah um and that that kind of thing has always turned me off yeah yeah like if if nothing else as libertarians we should be independent minded and in making our own choices <laughs> right. like isn't that kind of what the whole <laughs> thing is about yeah but when you what it is though is they're, they're trying to to create a block yeah like build a block and and to have a block like that, everybody's kind of got to vote in unison, you know, that's um, true. But if you have a real block, you don't have to tell people how to vote. Yeah. They should know. Yeah. I agree with that. Like, I mean, and, and there is a block and that's, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. The, the, I guess it's, I don't know. It represents a follower mentality to me, yeah. which I don't understand in the libertarian party. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm obviously a, a big tent person. I, I think that I, I say we take all kinds in the Libertarian Party. Like yeah. there are some fundamental beliefs that you should agree with in the Libertarian Party, mostly against the state. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Um, which is why I've always been accepting also of the, um, of the anarcho-communists. Yeah. Like I don't have a problem with the communist philosophy if you do it on a small scale and it's voluntary, yeah, like do what you want. Um, the idea of tearing down the main government and setting up little communes, I don't have a problem with that. Like, I think that's libertarian enough. Yeah. Well, and, and that's kind of the flip. Like, so under our system that can happen, but under the strictly yeah. communist system, <laughs> right. that can't really happen. Or I mean, even I have, the system we have now. I like, have issues with communism as an ideology for a state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you got to also remember that. Uh, so, my degree is in anthropology. Yeah. Now, while I mostly did f- physical anthropology, so um, human evolution, uh, anatomy and physiology, primatology, um, that kind of thing, I, uh, forensics, did a lot of forensics too, but I, I got enough cultural anthropology as having to fill in gaps um, that I couldn't fill with with more hard science anthropology um, to understand. And I, you don't even need anthropology for this, but it, just as you know, by way of my background um, to understand that the vast majority of human history, humans have functioned under essentially a communist society. Yeah. It, it's been communal groupings, tribal groupings yeah. um, where people were interdependent. Um, 
but it wasn't a state in the way that we think of a communist state. Yeah, and how many people are you talking about under these groups? I mean, you're talking about 50 to 100 probably. Yeah, I can see it working under those type of yeah, terms. Yeah, because everybody knows everybody else. Everybody knows who are the free riders. Yeah. Um, you, you can't take advantage of the system. I mean, you can take advantage of the system, but it's not anonymously. Everybody yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah. And there's there's peer pressure put on those people that are free riders. To do better. To do better, yeah. exactly. Um, and I think that that's actually like a really beautiful system Yeah. and, and, uh, much of my life too, like my friend group has functioned essentially as a communist group, yeah. um, where we weren't, um, we weren't keeping track of debts and like everybody kind of pitched in for the things that we needed and whoever had it took care of it at the time. And it yeah. would goes around, comes around and yeah, Absolutely. no big deal. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I actually like really like that system on a small scale. Yeah. As long as everybody knows what they're getting into and you can opt out. Yeah. Like you didn't have to be a part of my friend group. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> if you didn't want to ever have to worry about paying for dinner when nobody else had money, then you could just not go out to dinner with us. Like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, or buying the pack of cigarettes when, we were all collecting change. I, I, I mean, I remember being in college and um, my closest friends, like none of us had any money because we were college kids and we didn't have <laughs> jobs and, we, you know, yeah. we we're just kind of scraping by on what our parents gave us, which never seemed like enough. And like, I remember, um, you know, just picking up every penny nickel and dime that I saw on the ground all day long and so forth so that my friends and I, we could pull all our change and buy one pack of cigarettes for us for the night. Yeah. And we didn't all smoke the same thing. And so then it was like a rotating thing about who got their <laughs> brand <laughs> and right. like, <laughs> so on, oh, wow. you know, but that's, yeah. I wasn't a libertarian then either, but, yeah. um, but I, I mean, there's, there's like a kind of beauty to that way of living together yeah i don't know i i appreciate that kind of uh, i don't know camaraderie and interdependence and yeah but the more you scale something like that up the less it seems to work yeah well it, it, there's a level at which um you end up with rulers not leaders yeah and, and so that's the problem with uh, with large scale societies is that, like I've always identified the difference between rulers and leaders is voluntarism. Like leaders are respected and voluntarily followed. Yeah. Rulers are not. Yeah. <laughs> and at some level, you end up with rulers, not leaders. Yeah. Uh, is I mean, it's true in this country too. Oh yeah. I, it doesn't have to be communist, although we've moved far, <laughs> in pretty that close direction. to it. Yeah. Um, but there's. I don't know. There's still a difference, but the point being though, that I'm, I'm content with like a, a broad range of libertarian like positions being in the libertarian party. Yeah. Um, as long as the Mises caucus folks are in control, I would prefer that. <laughs> I would prefer that too. <laughs> I would prefer that. Um, but not to the point that, not to the point that we're alienating the others in the party. Right. Um, I mean, I do think that that our message should be the one that's that's most broadly put out. Um, but at the same time, like I, just like you, like I don't want the left libertarians to completely go away. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mind them being part of things. And I, and I don't. I think that the Mises Caucus should should palette its message to to incorporate them. Yes. Like, I mean, and I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, otherwise you end up with the same thing as the left libertarians' reaction to Donald Trump at our convention. Yeah. Where you're just trying to exclude voices that you don't agree with. Yeah, we don't, none of us want, or we don't want that. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you want, want everybody to kind of be able to have their say and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. I mean, there's nothing so anti-libertarian as trying to exclude... Yeah. voices that you disagree with. Well, and, and use censorship, like I say. I don't have... Yeah. I mean, that's that's not cool anywhere. Yeah, dissent is just an important part of moving forward anyway. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I come from a science background, so maybe that's part of why I feel that way. But, yeah. you know, the what I've always tried to explain to people, who, because the, it's just not how it's taught, is that science progresses by, um, by falsification. Yeah. It used to be taught that way. I mean, that's the way it was taught to me when I'm in school. Yeah. But it doesn't seem, from what I can tell, that that's the way it's taught now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some things have changed since I it's was in science. school. <laughs> because science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have to do an episode on science. <laughs> well, we've we've done enough of that. I mean, that's yeah. just something that'll come up whenever we actually finally do our real big episode on climate change probably. Oh, yeah. Um 97% of scientists agree that's just a lie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on how you frame the question. Yeah. Um I mean, if they're asking uh, do you believe that climate change is occurring? Yeah, I believe that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is occurring, and I'm surprised it's not 100. Yeah, right. <laughs> because that seems like an unassailable... Because the numbers are the numbers, right? Yeah, fact. Climate changes all the time, has always changed, and will always change. Yeah. Uh, What's the, the opposite of climate change? Climate, <laughs> climate stagnation? That don't know, sound good. That don't sound like what we want. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> um, but it, like when you start introducing some more information into the question, like do you think that humans are causing climate change? I bet that number goes way down. Yeah. And especially if you start asking, do you think humans can do something about it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of dissent in that field. Yeah. And it's just not how it's presented. But science is about dissent. And I think that politics is too. It is. And so I want dissenting voices around. I, I don't want a whole big group of people that all agree on everything. I, I, that just seems like slow death to me. Yeah. And, uh, and which I think that we're seeing in this country with the Republicans and the Democrats, honestly, that there's... Yeah really no room for dissent there. They're certainly, especially over the last decade, maybe, um, really kind of eliminating dissent from public discourse about yeah. a wide range of topics. Oh yeah. And uh, I think that that's, um, well, I, I mean, think that's the death of the empire, right? You, like that's, that's one of those things that, that happens when the powerful feel like they maybe don't have quite as tight a grip on everything as they used to. Well, they have to s switch from using the soft power to the hard power. Yeah. Where they can't, where, when the propaganda quits working, there's other means they have at their disposal, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, um, so because of, I just, I, I was just really disappointed in the black pill thing. Like, uh, I, you know, I don't, this didn't work out exactly how I wanted. So I think I'm going to step away from the party. Yeah. This, I don't know. It just well, seemed ridiculous to me. And but you were saying the same kind of thing to me the other night. Like I feel the same way. You know, <laughs> like I feel, for me personally, I feel like I have to distance myself from Oliver Chase. Like Chase I just Oliver. Chase Oliver, whatever. The I hell know his name this is. is a problem. If you have two first names, it's always difficult. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of that um, that guy that did the Richmond North of Richmond thing. Oh yeah, it was like Anthony Oliver, Oliver Anthony. Like I don't. It's one of those. It's one of those two. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. Now that you mention it, my favorite line in that is um, uh, "Living in the New World with an Old Soul." Yeah, that just that hits yeah. me. You know that right. that strikes me as feeling very familiar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not the point though, but yeah, Chase Oliver, I, I understand why you'd want to distance yourself from Chase Oliver, but I don't think that Chase Oliver is a failure. I still think that Chase Oliver is an improvement over a Gary Johnson in terms of, you know, like getting a more libertarian message out there. Although there's, I really had hoped that he would stick to, Core principles. Yeah, core principles. Stay away from culture war stuff. Yeah. And just talk about war and economics well, and, and government power. And I've said that on this podcast. If he can focus a campaign on that type of stuff, I'll support him. Mm -hmm. But I ain't seen it yet. Like, I mean, the interviews I've seen him do has been, which in his defense, that's what he's getting asked about. Yeah. I mean, the only interview that I've seen with him really since his presidential nomination was with Reason Magazine. That's the one That's the one I'm referring to. I thought I saw him on something else, but I, I maybe that may have been before the nomination mm -hmm. uh, where I was looking at old stuff. 
And uh, yeah, I certainly had some disagreements with what he had to say about the, the trans stuff. And, um, I think I it's mean, kind of important to get into maybe a little bit of why we disagree with some of that, because I've talked to some libertarians who generally think that the right position is a, a parents should be able to parent their kids however they feel. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it is an important part of libertarianism, the parental right over the state right over the, over children. I agree. Um, but there are obviously limitations. Yeah. Mm. Now here's the, going back to um, the more sciencey side of me. Yeah. <clears throat> as unfortunate as it is, sometimes you have to make some mistakes to figure out what's right. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, that's just the truth of it. Now I've read yeah. a whole lot of the cast report and obviously at this point there is not good data supporting transitioning medical transitioning of children. And I, I mean, there's a lot of question about puberty blockers and there is a lot of negative ed- evidence about uh, cross-sex hormones. Yeah. And of course, like surgical transitioning is completely irreversible. Well, and in and, and Chase's defense, like he's came out pretty hard against that. Yes, he has. Um, I'll, get, I'll give him and, that. Until adulthood and yeah. so be it. Well, and and, and, and I think adults can do whatever the yeah, hell they exactly. want to. I'm good with that as well. Now, you could ask some questions about whether an 18-year-old even is capable of making those kind of decisions, but... I'm, uh, I'm comfortable. But that's the number that we have settled on. That's the on, number we've chosen. So. And I'll tell you, I'm I'm pretty good with that number. Um I think I think 18 it's there's no perfect answer because the truth is is all human beings are different. So what's yeah. right for one isn't necessarily right for another. But I think 18's a, a solid. But you remember Milo Yiannopoulos getting in a lot of trouble for saying exactly that. Yeah. When he had his homosexual experience with a, an adult male when he was 15 or 16 or whatever. And he yeah. felt like he was making perfectly it, rational. Yeah. He knew what he was and doing. adult decisions at that time, but not everybody does, but he got in a whole lot of trouble for making that statement. Yeah. There, um, there is a lot of gray area here. Oh, absolutely. And so, yes, uh, we believe generally in parental rights, but, um, if you're worried about your your teenage daughter getting pregnant, we don't accept that you have the parental right to chain her in the basement for f- four years or something. Yeah. <laughs> either like there there are limitations to this. Yeah. Um, and it's it's funny to me that that that's not really recognized. Like how where to draw those lines at? Well, where to draw those lines is a tricky question. It is. Which, but. which is why I come back to the idea. I mean, that's where I stand on the abortion thing yeah. is that like, where do you draw the line? There's only two places that are, that you can consistently draw a line that everybody can understand. And that is uh, conception and birth. Yeah. Somewhere in between those two points, life begins and independent life exists. Yeah. But I don't know where that is. And so my position is to get the government out of it entirely. And and to be fair to Chase, in that interview, that's what he was saying, too. That That is his position on the hormone blockers. Is to just, it, it is a medical decision, parents, children, doctors, and that that the government should be out of it. And while I understand that position, like, then you go back to the... Chaining the kid in the basement. Chaining the kid in the basement. I just... And, I, like, obviously that... And, is a moral well, obvious, problem. Obviously, that is child abuse. Yes. And for me, as someone who's raised two kids or working on raising two kids pretty close, mm-hmm. um, kids just are malleable. Like you yeah. can you can influence them too easily to, and it it just the the idea that think that they can make that decision on their own or that the parent can make that decision it just comes off as child abuse to me. Yeah. And well, I just that is the problem exactly is that there are limitations to what can be done morally to somebody and that there is a, an obvious societal or media or government or medical system or like there are people pushing this agenda this is, this is being very pushed. hard um in a way that has made a huge difference in the demographic uh 
frequency, I guess, of this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, the rapid onset gender dysphoria is less than 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, there has been historically throughout history, a very small percentage of mostly men, yeah. um, who at a very young age identify as women. Yeah. Um, it's not exclusively men, but a huge majority of them. Yeah. Um, and it starts very, very young. Yeah. This thing with teenage girls identifying as men is new. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's completely historically unprecedented. Like this is never, no girl has ever done this. Yeah. But the percentages were just like, yeah, the volume of this is, uh, is (laughs) something very new. And, so there's something else going on. This is not a deep-seated psych- psychiatric issue or psychological issue that has been embedded in human brains for a long time in the same way that the early onset gender dysphoria that's mostly men has been. Like yeah. this is something that has been recorded throughout history. This rapid onset gender dysphoria, this is something new. And so I don't think that it's a part of our biology. Yeah. It's being spread in some other way. Yeah. The social contagion is the uh, obviously the most obvious explanation of it. So, I mean, my feeling on it is that that should the the gender dysphoria. Um, I did talk to the doc very very briefly about this, um, and the doc told me uh, just recently actually, and the doc told me well that I just don't understand what gender dysphoria <laughs> is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> essentially, and that the the um, the reason that the push is to uh, kind of adopt the preferred gender or the the psychological gender as opposed to the biological gender is that you're trying to relieve um, anxiety and stress related to the gender dysphoria. Yeah, and I didn't get to talk very long about it. I, I, I told the doc that we would have to have a much longer conversation about this sometime <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Um, but my initial response to that is, well, yeah, I, I have OCD and, but nobody has ever told me that, well, what I need to do is kind of relieve the anxiety of, and stress of my obsessiveness by developing more compulsions. <laughs> yeah like that's quite, not been the answer it's quite and i don't the see opposite. the difference yeah. yeah no i agree um which is weird to me because as somebody who suffers from the same type of thing mm-hmm. like like i create the w- rituals to try to relieve the anxiety exactly because i know if i perform the ritual i did the task yes yes <laughs> like, exactly <laughs> Um, that's, I know it's funny how people understand OCD as being the ritualistic side, but it's not, the ritual is a byproduct Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of the intrusive thoughts. Yeah. Um, but I don't see the difference there. So why is psychology not treating OCD by encouraging you to develop more rituals to relieve the anxiety of your obsessions? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'd like to talk to somebody who had a little inside knowledge on some of that because yeah. it just it, it just doesn't jive up to me. But there is a uh, oh gosh, I wish I could remember the name of it. I think it's just like body dysmorphia or no, I think that's what it used to be called. I think it has some new name now cuz things in psychology ch- change names all the time. Yeah. Same issue. But there is a um a, a psychological issue where people feel like parts of their body aren't part of their body. Yeah, I've I've heard of this. All right. Yeah. Like so you think that your I don't know, like your your forearm on your left side doesn't belong to you. Yeah. And there has been um recently reasonable evidence that it that there's an improvement in in their psychological lives to remove that forearm. Yeah. That As they feel better without it. Without it. But you've just handicapped somebody. Yeah. Like literally just handicapped somebody. Yeah. Um, and so there there is like kind of a back and forth push about that. Like, is this a reasonable way of treating this problem? <laughs> um, or because it it may challenge the 
you know, the Hippocratic ideal of do no harm. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I don't see that there's the same kind of, of back and forth push. Like, is this the right thing with the, with the gender dysphoria? No, issue? it's all lean in. Yeah. Um, and I don't understand why there's not more of, uh, of a question, um, or a challenge about it. Yeah. And so certainly the, like the society or culture as it exists, or at least the mainstream part, there is, there are very loud voices pushing this agenda around this, um, that's having an impact on people's decisions. Yeah. It's, it, this didn't, didn't just crop up naturally. <laughs> right. Uh, Wow, I talked a really long time about that. I, I didn't. Well, I think to. I think it's important though to kind of let people know where we're at on that. That mm-hmm. it's not just that we're some kind of bigots or racist because we don't like Chase Oliver. Yeah, like, that's well, that's and, not what's going on here. And, and and Chase believes in the hormone blockers. Yeah, he he and and he seems to really believe that they that they do no harm. That they're completely reversible. Yeah, which, which is the mm-hmm. Cass report. Does not confirm. No. Um, now it doesn't completely discount that. Discount it either, but th- the evidence just is not there. Yeah. And there do seem to be at least some cases where it is absolutely not irreversible. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it definitely does some harm in some cases. Yeah. So, um, so there's a real question about whether you should start instituting that kind of idea, especially in people under eighteen, that we for a vast majority of decisions feel that they're not mature enough to make. Exactly. And even if when you include parents in this decision and doctors in this decision, I don't know. There is a question about who would you rather make the decisions? Would you rather the government or would you rather the parents in the medical system? I mean, I would rather the parents in the medical system, but there has to be some kind of limitation. I was going to say, there has to be lines drawn, though. Like, yeah. I, that, that's where I'm at. Um, and may it be government that draws those lines, as long as they're drawn in the right places, which I know is tough. <laughs> I know that's a tough thing to y- swallow. Y'all didn't see the significant look that yeah. I gave him. I, yeah, that. I feel it. Like, I, I understand that, that it is that it is hard. But, like, there does have to be lines drawn between, you know, you know, just, just medical care and child abuse. (laughs) Like as far as I see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, while I am not, I I would never be an advocate of just experimenting with chit with children. Yeah. Like I said, though, progress requires some mistakes too. Like in order to figure out that something's wrong, you got to do it. Yeah, but I feel and, like this cast report deal ha- hammers a lot of that out. Well, it, it does, but it's still a small still open. part of data. I mean, yeah. it, it just doesn't cover a lot of years. You yeah. don't have enough time in, in the same way that I was complaining about the vaccines in the first place. Yeah. Like, you don't have enough time. You don't have the longitudinal studies to make the statements that you're making. And yeah. that's really what the cast report says more than anything. It does point out that they're there appear to be some problems, but it also says that we just don't have the data to know definitively. Yeah. Wow. That we just haven't been able to accumulate enough data in the time that we've had, that we've been looking at this. Yeah. Wow. I know what my instincts tell me. Well, sure. But I get it. My instincts are decisions for other people's kids. I agree. Um, so I, understand I, I can where if they're going to chain them in the basement. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I understand <laughs> where he's coming from on this. Yeah. Um, I just wish that he would stay away from the topic because that's, it's not a universal feeling among libertarians. Oh, that it's you should, definitely not a universal. Well, I mean, there are libertarians with him on this, so mm-hmm. I'm not trying to discount that, but from what I'm seeing, libertarians are in pretty good form against it. Yeah, well, the people that dissent are always louder in these kind That's of. That's maybe true, uh, and I, and you when know, you're talking about I'm, social media this is all anecdotal because it's all based off the LP groups that I'm in. Yeah. So I mean, I and I tend to be in groups I tend to agree with that are more <laughs> so, conservative side of the exactly. libertarian. Exactly, and I do so try to spread it out conservative. because yeah. I don't want to be in an echo chamber. Chamber, but you know, mm. it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but I understand why libertarians would not want to to get behind Chase Oliver or align themselves. Yeah. 
with him through these kinds of, of issues. Uh, and I, you know, I already said my own concerns about him that I don't, and this is kind of another example of that is that his first instinct is to buy into the propaganda narrative. Yeah. I mean, he buys the propaganda. He seems to be just late to the pickup yeah. pretty consistently. And he's really good on the war stuff now, but two years ago when I talked to him, he was not good on the Russia Ukraine thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was buying the propaganda. Right. Um, and that all Russia those, was going to take over all of Europe after they yeah, went through yeah, Ukraine. Which was like the literal propaganda that was out there. Exactly. Like, that, that's what they were saying. Um, um, and the same stuff with the COVID. People keep digging up all these tweets, old tweets of his through COVID that are, like I say, they're not completely... They could be worse. I'll say that. Yeah. But there, it, it's clear that at that time... He was drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah. Well, he wasn't advocating government lockdowns no, and mandates wasn't. and stuff I, I like that. No, he wasn't. I will say that. But I think that that's totally fair. I mean, especially now. I mean, as far was, as I can tell, his stuff went on longer than it should have. Yeah. But I was doing the same thing at the very beginning of COVID. Yeah. I was opposed to government lockdowns and mandates, but I was saying, "Hey, be responsible. Like, if you're yeah. sick, stay home." Yeah. I mean, and I was doing that. I locked myself down when I was sick. Yeah. Um. You know, I had uh, I had a parent that had some health issues that I certainly didn't want to infect. Yeah. Um, but that changed like pretty early. Yeah. For for me, I mean, and even then, I was like, you got to make your own decisions for yourself. Like, you got to decide your risk level yeah. that you're comfortable with. That was always my position. Yeah. Um, yeah, my my assessment was let it rip the whole time. But, yeah, <laughs> but um, I but I respect the fact that people want to be more cautious. But you were wearing a mask when you went and visited my mom too. I did. I oh, mean, absolutely. Like, yeah. You know that's no. So well, yeah, uh, and I like that type of thing. I understand, but I mean that was my out of my concern for her, right? Like, I mean, I wasn't wearing a mask anywhere else. That was yeah. oh, in no, fact no, that's no. literally the only time. I wore a mask through COVID was, mm -hmm. was when I went to go visit your mom. Yeah. I can't think of any other time that I was literally, or that I like seriously wore it like to try to actually do something. Yeah. Well, I mean, I gave up, when was it like June maybe when the Danish studies came out that said mask wearing had no effect on uh, infection rates. Yeah. I was like, well, forget this then. <laughs> right. I mean, as soon as there was some data that went one way or the other, I, Followed the it. data, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that it's I think that it's reasonable for people to be concerned. Um, I don't think that it, I'm okay with his COVID stuff as long as he was never advocating government. As uh, I will say in his defense, like I say, I never really saw any. I I, I haven't seen everything he put out, but yeah, the stuff well, that's being either. dredged up doesn't never really advocates for government. But it just bothers me because it does show that he was in pretty heavy on the propaganda. Yeah. And well, that's what bothers you, me. Though. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth is like even as much pushback as I gave to the things that were saying and, and as much skepticism as I applied to it, yeah. the, propaganda gets to you. It does. Hell, I mean, I, so I went to a Baptist school through elementary school up until I went to middle school. Yeah. At the height of the AIDS crisis. Yeah. And to this day, unprotected sex has an impact on my psyche. Yeah. Like it does. I'm yeah. still hesitant. Yeah. I like it. And it's still, you know, man, I'm really revealing a lot on this podcast. <laughs> um, and, and still to this day, whenever I have sex with somebody new, yeah. it bothers me for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Like I, I actually worry about what I might have picked up. Yeah. Some of that's probably the OCD we were talking about well, earlier. Well, some of it certainly <laughs> is. I mean, I was also the guy that when I worked on the ambulance, I would literally wash my hand five times on my on the way out of the hospital and stuff. But, yeah. um, but that propaganda sinks in even when you know better. Yeah, no, it's true, and I remember that specifically through COVID. Like, I mean, as as hard as I was against the vaccine, like I had thoughts like, man, like. All of these people are saying that they've got to know more than I do, mm -hmm. even though I know I know more than they do. Like yeah. it's, it. But it, you're right; it does. It, it will. It will definitely get you. But that's mm -hmm. where I think, as far as like a libertarian leader, they needed to have that courage and strength to get through that. And obviously, Chase didn't have it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I agree with that. 
um, I think that he would have contributed to the the fear. Yeah. Um, and when Bird been. Flu comes out, he's going to be all over that. He's, yeah. He's well, be. Bird Flu is out. I mean, that's uh, that's yeah, the new thing, the, right? When, like, we, we've had three infections in this country already of people. I heard there was a death. <laughs> oh, that was in Mexico. Oh, was it in Mexico? Oh, that didn't count. And it was a different strain of Bird Flu. <laughs> was it? Okay. And, it, you know, there's, of course, the age, now age-old question of did he die from Bird Flu or, or with, with Bird, bird flu? flu? Yes. So, who knows? Oh. Uh yeah. But I mean, this is a, they're trying to stir up fear about this. Oh, they absolutely are. Right before an election. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> an election that is not looking good for the Democrat in. <laughs> Just uh, saying, like. Speaking of, um, Trump's a felon. Oh, yeah. 30, oh, dude, 34 convictions. Unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, we we mentioned it briefly briefly last week because the word had just it come had out just when we started out. the yeah. podcast. But uh, man, I'm amazed at how much they're hammering on this point. Well, this, um, but because this was the whole reason they brought the case was so they had a talking point to to just beat the man over the head with. Yeah. Do you um, think it's a valuable talking point to them? Do you they, think it actually like promotes their? Cause? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, I absolutely don't think it. I don't think it does. But mm. they believe that it does. Yeah. Um, or they wouldn't be doing it. Um, and it, this is something I just wanted to kind of mention. I want everybody to kind of think back the past few years, and especially as Trump was kind of coming out and gearing up his presidential campaign around here. Like he was a he was not looking good in that run. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the polls weren't great. People were upset with him about what happened during COVID and how yeah. he, his supporters were upset with him over how he handled COVID. Yeah. Um, and it, he would not. If you remember, he wouldn't back down from yeah, how great the vaccine won't apologize. was. We can come back to that. Issue yeah. Too. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was. Uh, yeah. Ab- oh, that's a, a, a problem he has mentally. <laughs> but um, yeah. So. So anyway, my point is, is he was really weak until they started bringing up all of these court cases and talking about um, the January 6th stuff and prosecuting him. And the more that they've ginned that stuff up, the the more popular he's gotten. So he's right back where he was in 2016 again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, just waltzed through the primary. Um, well, it's not done yet, really, well, yeah, officially. I mean, officially. Like they haven't had their convention. They haven't so had the convention. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like he, but I mean, he, he just waltzes his way through it. So it, it's just amazing to me that they think that going after him this way is a winner. Yeah. Um, the only thing I can come up with is that they, they must think that they've got to put him in jail. Like that's the only way that the only thing that way they can stop him is to jail him. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know what else they can do. Yeah, I mean that's probably true. I'm interested to see what happens with this. I don't think that they'll. I don't think that they will jail. I don't think that they will either. I don't think that they can. Um, I mean, that would cause a. I mean, you're talking about kind of uprising. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I I do want to just remind some people of some things, especially any of you out there that are like, well, he was found guilty on 34 counts obviously he did something first off it was 34 counts of exactly the same thing yeah. um it's 34 incidents of the same event essentially yeah like as i understand it um, which is a like bookkeeping error as far as i well, can tell I, that, I mean that's part of it too like if he goes to his attorney and says this is a thing that i want to do yeah, and his attorney says this is how we do it. I don't know how Trump's responsible if it's illegal. Yeah, like unless his tr- attorney said, "Well, we can't do it legally, but we can do it this way," or if Trump said, "I know this is illegal, but this is what I want to do." Yeah, but I, I haven't seen any evidence of that. No, uh, like the whole point of having a professional do these things for you is so that they can do it on the up and up because you That's... can't possibly understand everything. Yeah, so I don't know why he's responsible for his attorney or his accountant screwing things up anyway. Yeah. Like, but (laughs) beyond that, I just want to draw attention to the phrase novel legal theory. Yeah. Because this keeps coming up. Which was used here. Yes. (laughs) A lot. Yeah. Um, They admit themselves that the whole thing was processed through a novel legal theory. And I I just want to give you another definition of novel legal theory. All right. What a novel legal theory really says, if you're using a novel legal theory, what you're saying is 
we're going to use the law for something for which it was not intended. Yeah. That's what a novel legal theory means. And I just want everybody to think about that, that we're using a novel legal theory to prosecute a former president, something of which has never been done. Yeah. I mean, it's not like they went like this after um, Bill Clinton mm. when he paid all of those women off. Yeah, right. Um, like, I mean, it, it's it, this is just unheard of. And it's for a misdemeanor that they elevated to a felony by saying that it was used in the commission of other crimes, other crimes that were never prosecuted or even identified. Identified, yes. Um, and that Alvin Bragg uh, is a person who has consistently reduced actual felonies to misdemeanors to prosecute for other people. And he is a guy who ran on, I'm going to get Trump. Yeah, that was his campaign. So... I mean, if you accept this as like a, like a legitimate justice in any way, I just don't think you're paying attention. No. And I'm not even going to say that he didn't do anything wrong because I don't really know. I mean, maybe he should be prosecuted for these kind of things, but the... It shouldn't be under a novel legal theory. Yeah. Though. Like, I mean, I mean, if he committed a real crime, let's prosecute him for the real crime. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that this is... Um, uh, uh, word escapes me all of a sudden, but not justice. No, I mean it. It feels like exactly what he claim, what Trump claims it is. I mean, it just feels like a witch hunt. Yeah, um, and that's lawfare. Not, that's not how we conduct politics in this country. At least it hasn't <laughs> been before. Yeah, um, and that's like I say, say what you will. I mean, if you do the crime, you do the time. I'm all mm -hmm. for that, but. It, this this is not that mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's it's just not like none of this it's it blows my mind that we're going down this road and to think that the other side won't use this down to do the same thing 10 years from now yeah. is is what's really bad is like this is kind of a pandora's box that's been opened here that you can't really put back in mm -hmm. there's a real irony that the that the democrats are pushing this idea that if trump is gets in office, he's going to use the justice system against his enemies. When his enemies have been doing the same thing to him. For the last two years, at least. At least, yeah. I, I know. That's what's that's what's funny to me about it, is that the concern is that Trump as president will use the justice system against his enemies, but what is the Biden administration doing? Yeah, it's the same thing. So, Although, in a lot of ways, like you have to be fair, it's not the federal justice system that's doing yeah, this but really you, but but you know behind the scenes the the yeah, level, i don't know the, how it could happen without their consent it's it it has to like yeah. i say they're on some level they're influencing this <clears throat> um um there was a an economics topic that i wanted to hit but i, I don't think that we're going to have time so we'll just save some clips for next week oh okay um and uh we'll address that later when we have a more like hard news episode next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing is, so I, I had a long drive yesterday and I got the opportunity to listen to the Dave Smith, um, Chris Cuomo debate on valuetainment. <laughs> I don't know how you felt about that. I still haven't finished it actually. I still got like, not much. I got like maybe 20 minutes of it left or something, but that was just crack for me, man. Oh, like, was it? Oh, God. It I was, was so bored. Man. Really? I, uh, yeah, I thought it was... I, I wish I hadn't wasted my time listening to it. Oh. I mean, there were some aspects of it that I appreciated. Um, there was a really interesting bit uh, where Dave Smith was talking about if I have to get up every morning and listen to the news to find out if my governor is going to allow me to leave my house and go to work today and so on. Yeah. Like if we're not calling that authoritarianism, then the word has no meaning. Like there was a, a good bit there. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that it got really tedious in places where they were pressing Chris Cuomo so hard to apologize and he wasn't going to do it. Yeah. And I mean, he put a line in the sand pretty early on and on and yeah. on. And I, I thought just let it go. Cause I don't even care if he apologizes or not. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it doesn't it, matter. It, it doesn't affect me one way or the other, but I don't know. It was, it was just entertaining for me to have, to hear somebody that was like big during the time be taken the task. In yeah. That way. I, I appreciated that. Um, there was, uh, I think probably the most important 
line in that was um, when Dave was talking to him at the end of, about, you know, having this opportunity to confront people that were a part of the COVID regime and all we get is you. Yeah. <laughs> like that yeah. was poignant, I thought. But, yeah. you know, Cuomo, he, he he's just like shifting the blame Um, you know, it was the networks. It's what our audience wanted to hear. It was, uh, the doctors at CNN. I was, it was, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it happened to be. Um, and of course, like, I think it was really just his ego that wouldn't allow him to apologize Yeah, for anything. And like I said, I don't care whether he does or not. I, I did find it interesting. Like the only concession that he gave was on as the variance progressed that he saw a shift in the the mortality or whatever he thought or at least how dangerous the virus was as we moved into later variants and that he didn't start giving more pushback then i mean he he says that he regrets like not pushing back a little harder on the narrative at that point when it clearly seemed to have gotten less dangerous and so on but that's not much of a concession. And and <laughs> yeah. the main thing that was really driving me crazy in that is that he's talking about the original uh, <laughs> COVID virus and the first variant, which I forget what it was called, Delta or whatever. Uh, I think Delta may have been the first. I don't I don't remember. No, yet. there was the wild version. And then oh the, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the before Omicron. Yeah. And he was he kept ha- pounding on this point that he thought was like proving something about the efficacy of the vaccines and saying that, you know, um, until Omicron, 90% of the people hospitalized were unvaccinated. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but the, the vaccine wasn't even widely available till Omicron. Yeah. It's not really a comment on how effective the vaccine was. It's a comment on how few people had gotten the vaccine at that point. <laughs> at that point. Right. Yeah. This isn't a. This isn't actually a point in your favor that the vaccine was effective against the first couple of variants because just not enough people had gotten the vaccine. Yeah, and that ten percent <laughs> of the people in hospital had gotten the vaccine actually probably should be a point against you. Right, <laughs> that that many of them were already in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know. There's just some weird things about that. I did. Uh, I did appreciate what he had to say about um, these thirty four felony counts against Trump. Uh, yeah. He absolutely said that this is like politically motivated and yeah. um, it's obviously a political case, not a real criminal case and that it's absurd and that it's a, I, I think that he was also, you know, just that, well, this is a big bump for Trump. Like this is something yeah. that helps Trump and this we don't cl- want that. This you know? clearly helps Trump. Uh, um, by the way, it should be mentioned that he raised I think I heard 34 million like the day after the verdict came out. Like, I mean, he is, this is just a bonanza as far as fundraising goes. Mm -hmm. And with good reason. I mean, I don't know how anybody being honest with themselves looks at this and doesn't say like, he's just being attacked. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's clearly what it is, whether you like him or not. I mean, you can, you can have your problems with him and admit that this is exactly what he says. This is a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, one thing, though, that I did really appreciate about the Dave Smith, Chris Cuomo debate is that it made clear like what we're doing and what No Agenda is doing and what Dave Smith's been doing and a whole lot of other people in the space have been doing about just pointing out how dishonest the mainstream media is because he would say things and deny things and they get played a clip of him (laughs) like saying exactly what he just denied saying. Yeah. And. As if they weren't going to down even at that, even when it, when confronted with the with the clip, yeah, <laughs> blows um, my mind. And so it, it just um, it just reassured me in a lot of ways that we're like that we're on the right path and that we're you know that we need to provide good information because the the traditional sources of information aren't no, and they haven't been for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I'll admit that we get things wrong from time to time on this podcast. I really thought that Hillary Clinton was going to end up running in 2020, but, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's kind of a silly one, but, 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 you know, we get things wrong from time to time, but we are absolutely doing our best 
to present the information as we see it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, we're, we're not getting out here lying to you. Yeah. Yeah. What was is Owen Benjamin used to say, I may be wrong, but I'm not lying. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, I, I, I'm proud of our track record. Oh yeah. As we should be. <clears throat> I think we've been really good and really accurate on a lot of major issues that have come up since we've been doing this podcast for f- five and a half years or something. Yeah. Um, 2019. And that when we, it was Think like so. January or February, 2019. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, it was into January, 2019. Yeah. Uh, because the, the day I recorded the, um, interview with Dr. Miller was our five year anniversary. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Um, which I didn't realize at the time or I would have made a point about it then. <laughs> I mentioned it. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm, I'm proud of our track record here. I think that we've done really well at exposing uh, lies and misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, whatever they're calling <laughs> like all these words that they're using yeah. to describe what we're doing while they're doing. While it. they're doing the thing, yeah. And um, so, you know, I look forward to more years of this and I, I, you know, I hope that we've earned your trust over the years, even through our occasional mistakes. Yeah. Um, we can just wrap up there, I suppose. Like I said, I, I had a, what I think is an interesting economic issue, which, <laughs> which is just like schizophrenic economics from, uh, our government, yeah. uh, where they're, they're claiming that they're trying to make one kind of change, but then enacting policies that do the opposite and so forth that I just thought was funny. Yeah. Government's real good at that. Yes. If yeah. they can do anything, it's that. <laughs> we, we've talked about that in war a lot in the yeah. in the course of this podcast, and this is like a good economics one yeah. um, that I thought would be fun. And so we'll just address that next week along with, we'll catch up on some war stuff probably too. Yeah. We haven't addressed foreign policy in a little while, and some things have certainly changed, and we need to, yeah. we need to catch everybody up. Because yeah. I, know, I know that not everybody reads all of this goes and picks up that stuff on their own. (laughs) Yeah. So there was a, um, there was a libertarian podcast that I used to listen to years ago and I can't even remember what it's called. We are libertarians. That's what it was called. Yeah. I don't know if it still exists or not. It's changed. Um, Um, it's out there. That's one of them I picked up after the convention because I want some different libertarian perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, It's like the Chris Spangle show now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, the I see, I liked the other guy that used to be on there and I can't remember his name. Um, but he left the show and and then I kind of stopped listening to it because it lost my interest after that. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, but they their tagline used to be "We read the news so that you don't have to." Yeah, <laughs> I always thought that was a good one. Yeah, um, I, and I good. feel like that sometimes here. Yeah, but I'm content yeah. reading the news. I love this stuff. I yeah yeah you know, oh yeah. Uh, it makes me worse of a person, maybe in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> get really jaded. Um, but I I you know I'm interested. I'm into this. I like. I like knowing what's going on and I like sharing information with other people too, Yeah, which is really the main impetus. I think probably for us starting this podcast in the first place is I just like telling people things. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have all this knowledge. It's nice to, to let other people have access to it. Yeah. Be able to share it with a larger group than I could like organically just in the people that I meet and talk to on a day to day basis. Cause I don't talk to a lot of people <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> on a day to day basis. All right. So we'll wrap up there. Um, we're, yeah, there's nothing scheduled, right? So nothing I can uh, think of. yeah, we'll be back, um, next week. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like, and share, um, comment, subscribe, uh, leave reviews. You can always email me at Michael at the Liberty Um, I'm interested in like those of you that were at the convention or involved with the libertarian party. Like, how do you feel about how things have gone and are going in the future of the party? Um, because I'm still optimistic about it, but, but those of us that, that maybe feel like we lost a little bit with chase or whatever, we got to stay involved. 
Yeah, it's tough because um, I'm one of those. Like I'm, I'm very, like I say, I'm not happy with, I mean, you have to look at it though. The Mises caucus swept everything but the presidential. Mm-hmm. So I think the party's in good hands and I think that we have a future. But like I say, yeah. um, I, I'm with you. I'd be interested to kind of see where other libertarians, what other libertarians thoughts on this yeah. is. Angel, Angela McCardle was a first ballot winner for chair. Yeah, and I that's think that's a, a really that's good a sign. Big deal, yeah. like I say. Um, um, so, but yeah, like I say, I'm kind of with you. I'd like to kind of hear what some other libertarians think. Yeah. So agree, disagree with me. I don't. I don't care. Yeah. Um, I just like to hear what you think. Yeah. And uh, I know some people. I know some people locally that probably disagree with me on this. And so, yeah. You know, email me, text me, call me. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I'm not giving out my phone number on the podcast, but <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> uh, but if you don't know me, Michael at thelibertymike.com, you can contact me anytime. Yeah. And uh, so, but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.